know the, the Buddha's image of the two arrows. You get shot by physical pain, that's one arrow. And then you shoot yourself with another arrow, your reaction to the pain. And it's important to realize that second arrow is optional. Think about it for a minute. Suppose you were shot right in the chest by an arrow, and just picking up a bow and arrow to shoot yourself again, that would make the first arrow hurt even more. And then when you do the shooting, you've got the pain of the second arrow. And the important thing to remember is that we have the choice of whether to shoot ourselves with that second arrow or not. In fact, that's one of the most important lessons we can bring to the meditation is realizing that a lot of what we're experiencing right now, particularly in terms of the level of pain or pleasure in the mind, is the optional part. It's unnecessary. It's the result of choices, some of which we made in the past, but a lot of which we're making right now, and we're not even aware of them. The whole purpose of the meditation is to make ourselves more aware of those choices, which opens up the possibility of making different choices. The choice not to shoot yourself with the arrow, and to realize how that can be done. You can even choose how you breathe. Long breathing, short breathing, deep, shallow, heavy, light. There's a whole range of ways you can breathe. You can choose how you conceive of the breath, what's called perception in Pali, or sanya. When you're breathing right now, where do you think the breath is coming in? What sensations do you think are the ones that tell you that you've got to breathe in this particular way to get the breath in? You've got to tense this muscle, change the position of this part of the body, that part of the body. Can you choose to do it in a different way? To perceive the breath as the energy permeating all the blood vessels, permeating all the nerves going throughout the body out to every pore. Can you think of it as a whole body process? What does that do? What about the direction the breath takes when it comes in? Does it go up? Does it go down? John Fung once had an interesting perception to use of breath. He said, think of a channel right running down the middle of the body. This long line from the head down to the base of the spine, from the spine down both legs to the feet. And as you breathe in, think of the energy coming in to nourish that channel, and as you breathe out, think of it going out from that channel in all directions. Clear out the body. If you hold that perception of mind, what does it do to the breathing? Hakuin, the old Zen master, talked about getting Zen sickness which was basically a strong headache when he was meditating. And he would hold in mind the perception that counteracted it, which was to think of a big ball of butter on top of his head melting and flowing down. In other words, Zen sickness probably came from thinking of the breath energy coming up as you breathed in. And the counteracting perception was to think of it flowing down. So if you feel any pain from the breath, Think of different ways of breathing, and even if you're not sure that it's a pain coming from the breath, think about different ways of breathing to test. And then think about different ways of perceiving the breath to test that as well. And then look at what the Buddha calls verbal fabrication, the comments you're making on things as you're doing it. Are you making good comments or bad comments? Oftentimes the comments we're making on things are the worst part of the med the mind suffering. If there's a pain and there's a difficulty, your mind's not settling down and you're chattering to yourself about it in ways that just get you more upset, you've got to learn how to stop the chatter. One way I found really effective is trying to locate where in the mind there's a little pattern of tension when you think, and when you stop thinking that thought, where does the tension go away? Can the next time you think that thought, think of little knives going into that part of your body and just chopping everything up. Shred those thoughts to bits. And then be on the alert to see the next time a disruptive thought like that comes up and just try to chop it up wherever it appears. That doesn't mean you stop thinking entirely, just learn how to think in better ways. The Buddha talks about one of the important features of what he calls the customs of the Noble Ones, is learning how to delight in abandoning and to delight in developing. 
In other words, learn how to enjoy the process of fighting off your defilements and developing strong qualities in their place. A lot of times we're sitting here and thinking, oh, why do I have to sit here for the whole hour? Why do I have to go through the pain of the practice? That's just for one hour. In other places they force you to do two hours at once. And if you sit there just complaining about it, you don't learn anything. You're developing precisely the wrong attitude, the right attitude. Is, okay, here's the challenge. How long can I sit here without moving and without suffering from it? If you just sit there without trying to develop any discernment, it doesn't really accomplish much, aside from, on the one hand, developing more patience, but also developing some either skillful or unskillful qualities that nourish that patience. You have to be on the lookout for that. But the whole purpose of sitting here and watching pains arising and passing away is to learn what your mind is doing to make them arise and what you can do to make them pass away. And even if physical pain doesn't go away, you really want to focus on the mental pain. That's the difference between the, the suffering in the three characteristics and suffering in the Four Noble Truths. In the three characteristics, the simple fact that things change leads to stress. And as long as you're experiencing a body and experiencing the human world around that body, there's going to be change and there's going to be stress coming from that. But the question is, does that stress have to weigh on your mind? And that's where you have the choice. That's that second arrow. The first arrow is the suffering or the stress of the three characteristics. The second arrow is the suffering of the Four Noble Truths, which comes from craving, ignorance and all the other unskillful fabrications that are based on those qualities. So here's your opportunity to f f learn some new habits and learn how to enjoy learning those new habits. Identifying your old bad habits and separating yourself from them in the sense that you realize you don't have to follow them anymore. You can develop new habits. When they talk about developing a fighting spirit in the meditation, this is what they're talking about. Seeing the problems that arise as you're sitting here as challenges, and realizing that you can figure out how to deal with that challenge. It may take some time, it may take more time than you want, but learn how to not make that an issue. So be very careful about the thoughts that arise when you meditate. One of the reasons saying, try to tell you not to think at all, is so that you notice when you're thinking. And begin to notice that which thoughts are actually helpful and which ones are not. Yes, you've worked with a fighting spirit, seeing things as challenges that you're up for. Then it's a lot more likely you're actually going to find the solution to the problem. You don't find it by complaining or just sitting there and telling yourself not to think at all, trying to squelch every thought, because a certain amount of thinking has to go into figuring things out. Now, if you find that you're thinking and thinking and thinking, can't figure things out, then stop for a bit, watch for a while, see if you can see the connection between something you're thinking or any movement in the mind at all and the level of stress going up or down in the mind. And that'll give you a clue as to where you want to keep looking. So you can figure out which kind of thinking is helpful, which kind of thinking is not, and eventually figure out what the problem is. Learn to identify exactly which movements are causing the problems. And you see that there are choices. You don't have to make those choices. You can make other choices. The fact of choice is so important that it's one of the few issues the Buddha would actually go out and search out other teachers to argue with them, the ones who were teaching that you didn't have any choice in terms of the pleasure or pain that you experience, either because pleasure or pain were determined totally by your past karma, or that it was determined by some creator or some other impersonal force, or that everything was totally random. You had no idea of connecting cause and effect, because there was no connection between cause and effect. Whoever taught those things, the Buddha would seek them out to argue with them, because what they were teaching was just the most virulent and pernicious form of wrong view.
it's a shame that we see that so much in modern modern Dharma. There was a Buddhist magazine years back that ran a whole issue on the connection between Dharma and science, and the feature article was on how science basically teaches determinism, and so does the Dharma. You just learn how to accept, accept, accept that things are the way they are, and that's all you can do. What the Buddha has you accept really is that there is a certain connection between cause and effect that you can't change, but you can change the causes so you can get better effects. So that's what acceptance means, is trying to figure out the way things are and accept, okay, there are certain causes that you like, but they're not going to bring, lead you to happiness. You've got to learn how to recognize that. There are other causes, choices you can make that can lead to suffering, but you like those doing those things, but you have to face up to the fact that they do lead to suffering. That's what you have to accept. And then once you've accepted that, then you can figure out how to choose to do the things that you ordinarily don't like to do but will lead to pleasure in the long term, and how not to do the things that you like to do that will lead to pain in the long term, and learn how to enjoy learning these new lessons. This is where the image of the fighter comes in. Okay, you've got an enemy. Here the enemy is inside. And it's an old trusted friend, or a friend that you thought you could trust. But now you've got to do battle with it. And part of you misses the old friendship, but when you realize it was a false friendship all along, and you've been deceived by these thoughts all along, that makes it easier to fight them off and to enjoy the fact that you can finally get past the subterfuges and the tricks that these false friends are playing on you. So learn this part of the customs of the Noble Ones is to really enjoy, be up for the challenge of learning how to abandon unskillful qualities and to develop skillful ones. That makes all the difference in the practice.